Hi, you're about to watch an interview that I recorded earlier with Professor David Jakes about his site, Blick Mead, which is part of the Stonehenge landscape in southwest Britain. Now, this is a fascinating site because it dates, predates Stonehenge itself by many hundreds of years, and it goes way back into the Mesolithic period or the Middle Stone Age. And it dates from the very beginnings of the Mesolithic, about 9,600 BC, and it goes all the way through to about 4,000 BC. So as such, it makes it one of the, or the longest occupied Mesolithic site, not just in Britain, but in Western Europe. Now, during this time in the Mesolithic, there would have been cattle, herds of cattle called aurochs, who were much bigger than the cows that we think of today, about 1.8 metres tall. And they would have wandered through the landscape looking for grazing, but also looking for water. And at Blickmead, we have a spring and the aurochs were there. How do we know they were there? Because the excavation has uncovered hoof prints of these aurochs and also some of their bones as well. And when you get oryx in the Mesolithic, you also get people, and people were at Black Mead. How do we know this? Because there were hunter gatherers, they were following the oryx, and we've uncovered at Black Mead hundreds, if not thousands, of ancient Stone Age tools that were used by these people. So it's a fascinating site. Not only that, this spring has got some really unusual properties in that it's got a type of algae living in it that turn things pink not just pink, but bright pink. And this wouldn't have gone unnoticed to a hunter-gatherer who was much more used to the earthy browns or leafy greens that you would have been seeing uh, in the landscape then. So this is a really great interview. We start talking about Stonehenge and the Stonehenge landscape, um, just to put it into context. And then we move back in time, way back, go into the Mesolithic period and talk much more specifically about the site at Blickmead in more detail. So welcome, David. Oh, welcome. Thanks ever so much. Delighted to be here, Danny. This is really exciting. It's really exciting to meet you, actually, to be able to talk about your project, because this is this is pretty major, isn't it? This is one of the earliest um, excavations that we've got in Britain, isn't it? It is. It's yeah, providing some of the earliest sort of, you know, insights into hunter-gatherers. So you know, British hunter-gatherers are typically seen as being in the landscape just after the British Ice Age um, finished around 9,000 uh, or about 11,000 years ago um, to um, about 6,000 years ago or so. And the wonderful thing about Bleak Mead or one of the wonderful things about Bleak Mead is it pretty much connects those dates right across. And as such, it's a unique site uh, in the UK and for Western Europe. We're going to be talking a lot about prehistory and the Stonehenge landscape. Um, if we could just do a little timeline for people, I think that might be quite useful. Sure, yeah. So some of the phrases that we're going to be using, for instance, we've got the Paleolithic, the Paleolithic. Paleo meaning ancient, lithic meaning stone. So that's the old stone age. Um, and that dates from about ish two and a half million years ago to about uh, 9,600 BC. And then next, we've got the Mesolithic. So Meso means middle, Lithic meaning stone, the Middle Stone Age. And that dates from about 9,600 to 4,000 BC. Moving on into time, we then come to the Neolithic. And Neo means new, Lithic means stone. So we've got the New Stone Age. And that dates from 4,000 BC to about 2,500 BC. Now, all these periods together are the Stone Age because people aren't using metals. They're making stone tools, napping things out of flint, um, things like arrows and axes. And, and then we move on into, uh, into more modern times uh, when they start using metal. We get the Bronze Age in about two and a half thousand BC to about 800 BC. And then following on from that, we get the Iron Age when people start using iron, making things out of iron. And that's from about 800 BC, right up until the Roman, the Claudian invasion, till the Romans arrive in about 43 AD. So that's a little bit of the sort of chronology uh, and some of the phrases that we're going to be talking about. But it's mainly, this is mainly about the Mesolithic, the Mesolithic, um, 9,600 to 4,000 BC that we're going to be talking about. So there we go. That's a bit of a, a timeline there. <laughs> mm. 
So when people imagine Stonehenge, obviously certain things spring to mind, don't they? Um, but actually, you know, it's not just about that monument, is it? There's a whole landscape involved. Yeah, I mean, something that um, I'm becoming increasingly aware of is just a lot of the monuments are in response to something. You know, rather than them just being new builds that come out of nothing, and uh, and I think Stonehenge is, is is just the same as the other major monuments in the area, and some of them are quite a bit earlier than Stonehenge, like the Great Curses, for example, which is um, uh, Middle Neolithic. So th th this is Neolithic, meaning the first farmers essentially coming to the UK. Um, and that one that that goes in a good five hundred years or so before Stonehenge, but Stonehenge phase one, which is built ish again, 3200 to 3000 BC, would have been completely um, intervisible with the Cursus. So the idea that, you know, it, when it was built, it was in a completely empty landscape is, 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 is just absolutely out. Um, and there are, you know, there are some, um, some really interesting type of stepping stones to Stonehenge as I see it. Um, and it's not, I don't think we can possibly say that people had, you know, really type of intact, exact memories going all the way back to the, the first farmers there or their last hunter-gatherers in the landscape. But probably in some respects, and we know this from, you know, um, ethnographic evidence from other parts of the world like Australia or in America, we can see that actually memories really hold up incredibly well in oral cultures particularly type of big myths about ancestors. So really, we, you know, when we look at Stonehenge, we should see it as looking at least um, as much back as it's looking present and forward. The kind of foundations, as it were, of Stonehenge as we know it, uh, the monument, um, starts around uh, about 3000 BC, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. But exactly. you don't actually get the, so that's when you get the blue stones from the Preseli Mountains, isn't it, from yes. Wales? Yes. But and then the you, foundation ditch. And then you don't get the um, the triliths, which is yes. the thing that everyone sort of imagines, isn't it? The, the up, two upright stones with the lintel across mm -hmm. um, until later. That, that's about two and a half thousand BC. That's it. Yeah, so they may not go in and, you know, minimum 500, possibly even as much as 700 years afterwards. So just the idea that that circle is being... Is, is really special in, in probably really complex, rich ways over such a long period of time. And when people don't have written texts, you know, that, that's very, very important. And of course, some of the artifacts in the ditch are much older than the ditch. So there's lots of memories being activated and connected up. Of course, something else that's real standout about the Stonehenge Knoll is the first hunter-gatherer um, monuments. Um, well, it looks as though probably the first hunter gatherings in the whole of the UK were there as well. Um, in fact, under the old Stonehenge car park. So people listening to this might have parked their cars there or arrived in a coach. They were really incongruously displayed. They looked like mini roundabouts. They'd just been painted into white circles. Hardly any information about them at all. And that's partly because at the time, and up until really recently, you know, up until really um, hitting on Blick Mead, um, there was hardly any evidence of hunter-gatherers in the landscape, literally about 30 flakes of Mesolithic-looking flint work. Well, really, you know, for the whole extent of humanity, you know, going back to, you know, our beginnings in Africa, um, you know, we've been hunter-gatherers. It's a really good way of living, actually. I mean, certainly some studies have shown that uh, hunter-gatherers, so they're literally people are hunting big herbivores, or it could be very small little animals as well, especially if they're in areas where you're using resources intensively, or you're gathering, you know, especially things like hazelnuts or fruit. And it's a very nice way of living largely for its time. Uh, people would have had a bit of downtime in the hunter-gatherer period. Um, there would have been a bit of time for bonding and conversations and probably storytelling in a way that they may not have been quite in the same way in the Neolithic. I think the, 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 the main kind of thing to, uh, that's, that's really interesting is that transition there that you've got the end of the Mesolithic where pe people are hunter-gathering mm -hmm. and then you've got the, the kind of the beginnings of the Neolithic, people starting to farm, people starting mm -hmm. to settle down, they're not moving about as much. And it's a really interesting transition. 
maybe because I know you've got some ideas about this, haven't you? That you've yes. got people like hunter gatherers and then you've got farmers perhaps kind of interacting. Absolutely right. And we're so fortunate at Blink that we've got this data set which shows again, you know, it's scientifically that hunter gatherers were living um, in and around Blickmead at the same time the first farmers were coming over from continental Europe and, um, and were in the area. Um, there's a clear crossover with the dates and, and that's, that's, um, that's unique for, for England and arguably for Britain. It's really clear in the Stonehenge landscape that you've got two completely different cultures there at the same time. So, you know, Real loads of things come out of that. I mean, one of them is, I think, maybe something else to um, question is this idea that when you've got transitions or not, they happen or not nationally. I think it's miles more likely that there's a local picture going on. So I'm sure that in some places, the first farmers from the continent went into empty landscapes. Um, but in this one, they didn't. We know from our dates that. The Stonehenge landscape, pre-Stonehenge, is known for millennia in the hunter-gatherer period. It's immense. It's blimmin' epic. People, this is a really well-known landscape since, you know, from just after the Ice Age. So all those understandings and knowledges and type of, you know, um, feelings for the place potentially get transferred to farmers in the Stonehenge landscape in a way that maybe didn't happen anywhere else. So what can you tell us about Blick Mead then? I mean, this is a, a, a fantastic Mesolithic site, uh, one of the earliest sites within the uh, UNESCO uh, Stonehenge landscape. Well, first of all, it is the earliest one, and it's the earliest place where we know people were living. Um, our first um, dates fit really beautifully with the totem poles going up. So the, these, are, these are the earliest dates of Blick Mead. So they're around um, 8,000 to about 6,500 BC. And that's really exciting. And for, for people who are listening to this who know Stonehenge landscape, it's almost as though we've got a little hunter-gatherer, Mesolithic, Darrington walls in relation to, you know, the wooden posts up at uh, Stonehenge. Darrington walls is going in around 2,500 BC. And that looks like it's the um, place that people are living uh, with the people who built Stonehenge and okay. they're feasting there and having big parties in the midwinter. So you're thinking this is uh, that your site, Blickmead, is kind of a, an earlier version of that? It could be, and it's fascinating, Danny, because um, it's only just downriver from um, Darrington and uh, it's called geologically in the same way. There's a, it's a river cut which scoured out a hollow. So Darrington Waters has got a natural hollow and Blickmead has got the same thing. Most things are probably really noticed by hunter-gatherers and latest people as special in some way. Um, yeah, Blickmead's got the lot, actually, if you're a hunter-gatherer. It's uh, right by the river, but it's, it's got an accessible route onto the river by, along the spring line. Um, you've got what, far more um, resources to eat and to, to use in general because you're in a nice river valley, protected from the prevailing southwesterly wind. You know, really nice. And it, we know because we found these amazing aurochs hoof prints which are perfectly preserved underneath a stone and bone platform at Blickney which leads into the spring and um, that we've got these giant wild cows stomping through right through the site which is just a major thing amazing so that also gives a clue as to what they might have been eating and how they were type of interacting with animals. So actually let's talk about oryx for a moment because they're fascinating animals aren't they? Yes well these are these like super cows Danny about three times the size of a Jersey cow. And uh, so these are major resources if you can get hold of one. Wow. Running speed of about, probably about 35 miles an hour. Wow. Big, big tub of longhorn horns. These things would have been massive. And, and we know that they were of interest to prehistoric people because in the upper Paleolithic, of course, that great cave art in France, we can see them on cave walls. So they, they, were, they were a real interest. Why do you think the oryx are being attracted? That you say that we, you've found traces of their footprints, so there's herds of them wandering mm. through the area around Blickmead. Mm. Why do you think that is? Well, we're not sure for certain, but it, certainly where Blickmead is, you're on this uh, lovely area for oryx because you've got this sh shallow water. I've got extended growing season, so they would have a load to munch, um, and they would have made their way along because they drink massively because it's so big. 
and they would have probably trudged their way along along that river valley. But here and there, there would have been points where hunter-gatherers could have taken them down and, and intercepted them. And actually, I think the Stonehenge Knoll is a, is a, is a kill zone um, way before the stones go up. Um, good reasons for thinking that because you've got very shallow river valley there which is intersected by an old stream so these big cattle they would have followed where the water was accessible water and maybe we could talk a little bit about the spring then at blickmead yeah. there, there are a few interesting things about the spring itself aren't there yes there are um yes you, so you've got this strange um effect where um flints in certain parts of the spring not all parts turn pink when you take them out of the water and um, between us it was my mum that um, discovered that completely by accident I don't think this is a great thing when you run a community project yeah it's not the sort of thing you get professional archaeologists ever bothering to look for why would you pick up a random bit of flint but my mum I basically shooed her away when some specialists turned up because like me she talks a lot <laughs> went down the, she went down the spring line picked this stone up because she thought my um, nephew Harry would like it. And um, it turned pink in her pocket. She forgot she put it there. So on the back of that. Now, since then, science kicks in. So um, Professor David John from the Natural History Museum had a good look at it. And he said, She's, this is terrific stuff, that the um, fluorescent pink uh, is a natural dye. And uh, so it may well have been used as a colourant. How how does that work? Because I mean that's that's crazy. That doesn't happen every time you with any old spring, does it? What's the scientific process there? Right, yeah. Well, you've got yeah, you've got this algae called Hildenbrandia rivularis, which coats the flint. It happens because if you're in dappled light, so that's why it's only in a bit of a spring. You have to have very still water, and that water has to have a lot of iron in it. Um, so that's the combination. And uh, when you take it out, it reacts to oxygen. And we think this was happening back then. Yes, so uh, uh, Professor John is completely fine about that because he knows we can see that the springs were there then and there's no reason to think, and you know, there would have been trees and shrubs and things along the side there. No reason to think not. Plus, we found some of the animal bones we found in the spring have got red colourant on them, which may well have come from the Hildenbrandia. Back then, I mean, that must have been really striking. Oh, totally. I mean, at a time when you got the colour palette would have been basically browns and greens, to have something like, well, it almost is, it's like an effervescent pink. It's amazingly bright colour. I mean, it would have looked, you know, just type of Priscilla Queen of the Desert type of look about it, and it must have caught people's eye. And the fact you can get dye off it is interesting. Like, you know, uh, one of the other things about purity community project which is brilliant we, we had some lads from the local school which is called the Stonehenge School in Amesbury and I think they've made the best sense of the dye with the tools of anybody miles better than people like me Danny quick as a flash they said they thought that the dye was used for tattooing ah. by middle-aged archaeologists like me who's never had the tattoo I would have never thought of that but that really does make sense for people we know from Ertzi, don't we? And, you know, that mummified Beaker period body found in the um, Alps. His body was full of tattoos. So who knows? Mm. You know, maybe these people are going around with really bright pink um, tattoos. That's amazing, isn't it? I, I love that when, you, uh, when you're when you working with groups of volunteers, people within the community, and um, they just come up with this idea that archaeologists haven't, thought of because they're thinking outside the box a bit more I love that it's great isn't it yeah well Vince Gaffney was lovely he, he said when he came to the did some geophysics later he said that discovery would never have happened if you weren't a community project ha. Ah, I love it <laughs> yeah but also just thinking so we've got this so we've we've got the oryx coming to the spring we got the spring that's got this kind of really unique um properties of turning things pink um mm -hmm. so not only would you have amazing artifacts that you could color pink but maybe you're using them for a dye maybe for clothes maybe for tattooing mm -hmm. um but the other thing about the stream is that it runs throughout the winter, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Yeah, it's a spring that has a constant temperature. And uh, it's so striking when you see snow in um, Amesbury, how you, this thing is not the fact, just the fact that you can see that the spring's open for water. But of course, you've got vegetation growing all around it and, and sort of within it. 
and that would have attracted large animals. The people have asked me for a, a number of times, why did you think about going to Blit Meads? The thing was, is because I was actually at the time at least as much interested in animals as people. That I just thought, well, where are the animals going? And uh, nobody had really sort of considered that before, because obviously there are these amazing monuments and think about the people that built them. But this is an ideal place for people and, and definitely for animals who, are, who were probably there first. So really, it's, it, it kind of sounds like this spring, this ancient spring, we're looking at, what, 9,600 BC, yeah. is a really special place for animals. Yes, because they're attracted to it for the water, because it's running throughout the winter, it hasn't frozen, um, it doesn't dry up in the summer by the sounds of it, and then humans are attracted there because they're, they're hunting the aurochs. Yes, exactly, yeah. And it probably starts completely, you know, or not completely, but largely for practical reasons. You know, you know where the big resource is, and we know, for example, there's wild boar, you know, there as well. They like, you know, river valleys as well. Red deer, we've got loads of different types. So it's not just about aurochs, but yeah, aurochs predominate. Um, and yeah, people would have known that they were there. And, and initially, probably that was a great place to take them down, particularly because of the river cut, because those aurochs would have been walking in a natural hollow. And then if you maybe got your log boats and scared them out of the water, they'd have to run up a slope. So that would have really been, people would have had to be so ingenious massive teamwork to get one of those large animals down and imagine the stories that would have come out of it yeah absolutely and i think that mm. you just touched on a really important point there uh, about what stuart might call the lumps and bumps in a in, in a landscape um, mm. but here we're talking about the natural lumps and bumps um but that would make such a difference wouldn't it for instance if there's channels that you can channel animals down exactly and you can see the blit mead and you've obviously got the proof now of these wonderfully preserved tooth print or tooth prints there plus some spores from orox poo found by tony brown's amazing team at tromso university and southampton university but also you're bang on because stonehenge knoll is obviously also a higher place within a bowl-shaped environment and i think that it's very likely as i was saying earlier that these orox would have been following stream beds which actually go past the knoll. And again, people, uh, if you don't know Stonehenge or if you only go to Stonehenge, can I just say to everybody, please walk around the landscape. It's amazing yeah. there. It's, it's full of humps and bumps, actually. It's not flat. And these places would be natural to, you know, natural advantages for, for hunters. You probably would have got people's kids, you know, got sharp eyes, sharp ears up there, you know, picking up on the animals, you know, being really good doing, I don't know, flag waving or equivalents or something. Yeah, that's really interesting, isn't it? To try and imagine that landscape before Stonehenge as we know it was there. It really is amazing. Mm. Can you tell us a little bit about the evidence that you've found for the people then? What what did what have you learned about the people that were at Blick Mead? Well they're there it's really interesting that it looks like at least some of them are coming from elsewhere. Um uh, you know and I was saying earlier about a mini type of dying to wall thing. This is obviously a mini me version. But we have got, again, looking through a glass darkly, we've got some tools which come from elsewhere. So, for example, we've got some from Cheddar. Um, of course, Cheddar Man has one of the few Mesolithic skeletons whose DNA has been taken out of him. So we've got the fact that we it's likely that there's either an exchange of tools from somebody, with, somebody living in the Cheddar Gorge area in Somerset, this is in southwest Britain, um, or people have come from that area, which is only 40 miles away. Um, we got an idea of actually how people looked at Blick Mead as well. So just to throw that in, because a brilliant natural history museum and other people's research. But further out, yeah, we've got this really enigmatic slate tool, which um, petrochemical analysis by the Open University suggests that's either come from Cornwall or Devon in the southwest of Britain, or Wales, rather intriguingly, you know, to, to the west of Britain, where the maybe you know broader area where the bluestones came from, the tool is in the of a type that you can usually date to the sixth, fifth, or sixth millennium BC, um, and it's wonderful to be honest, Danny, because it's in the style of a Sussex type tool called a Horsham Point. So, simply put, it looks like a couple of people maybe sat together from different places, and someone was told how to nap. Where you, or, or type of flake slates in the style of a flint tool 
and then they put it in the um, spring. Haven't been used. And then we've got the Blickmead dog as well, and there's, that's been sort of controversial, the dog. What we can say now is that the dog's isotopes suggest one of two things. Either that, that dog lived uh, on chalk much further north um, of Blickmead, um, and that's because the oxygen levels in it suggest a much colder place. Um, or it could have been on a completely different geology, sort of igneous rock geology, which pushes it up north or west. Or it could be just from Blickmead, but it could have been a lot colder at Blickmead. Okay. One of those things. But I love the dog because it, it's domesticated species. And, you know, as we know, you're not going to get a dog walking a long way by itself. So actually, it's proxy for people movement, that dog. And, um, you know, as such, potentially, that's the, it recalls the earliest journey into the World Heritage Site. Um, at the moment, Oxford University is extracting its DNA, and we're hoping that that's going to pick up on its ancestry because they're very interested to see how dogs evolved from wolves. This is really fascinating, isn't it? Because it's, it's basically one of Britain's uh, earliest pets, by the sound of it. Yeah. Well, it might, have been a, it might have been a pet to some. I should think in general it was probably a hunting dog. That possibly is the reason why it's there. It may well fit with the aurochs. Um, uh, the running type of thought at the moment is it probably looked rather Alsatian-like, mm -hmm. which is no surprise because Alsatians are quite close looking to wolves. But yeah, it would have been absolutely loved by some people, but it would have been blimmin' ferocious if it was involved in taking a big animal like an aurochs down. Yeah. So it's a working a working dog. Yeah, maybe more like a sheep dog. Mm -hmm. You know, who knows? They may have communicated to it by whistling. Like you say, and if it's travelled from um, if uh, from far away, as yes. as, it, as it possibly suggests, then that also suggests people moving as well, yes. doesn't it? Yeah, we know it had a lovely diet at Blick Mead, by the way, because the. Um, uh, the, 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 uh, the, there's various different type of isotopes which I won't go into, but one of the types shows it was likely eating large herbivores and with a bit of fish to supplement. So it's probably munching on aurochs and <laughs> wild boar remains. It, you know, it had miles better dog food than any dog gets now. It's all very different to how life is now, in a way. It is, but maybe one thing that's similar is that like we're using Zoom now, and that it probably becomes a bit of a hub point blip means which you'd sort of need, wouldn't you, for in terms of sort of new ideas. That's yeah. why I think that slate tool is really interesting. And it's changing ideas. I think of bleak mead, I mean, the media, although in fairness, well, particularly the British tabloid called The Sun made this um, remark about it being the earliest evidence for people eating frog eggs. We actually found a, a cooked toad leg. And I think that's interesting, obviously way smaller thing than a big joint of aurochs. But what it does hint at is people are having to use resources of bleak mead very intensively, which I think probably implies there's a, quite a lot of people there, at least at certain points in the year. So ga people gathering, exchanging ideas, maybe, you know, there being type of wedding alliances coming out of it. It would have been a really well-known place, Danny, mm. in the hunter-gatherer Mesolithic. That's amazing, isn't it? Because obviously it continues to be a well-known place, doesn't it? When mm. we start to get sort of moving from the, um, the Mesolithic into the Neolithic, um, mm. and then we get that first ditch at Stonehenge uh, yeah. in about 3000 BC, um, following on to about 2,500 BC. That's when we get kind of Stonehenge as we sort of imagine it. Mm. And you've, you've, there's clearly lots of activity still going on there, but that's mm -hmm. what, we, what you're suggesting is that it, it, it stretches right back to the beginning of the Mesolithic period. Yes, in a very type of um, probably haphazard and worn out stories and, you know, that, that maybe have some little semblance of something in them. But I, I'm really interested in site, the site that Julian Richards found about 30 years ago. It's Conabry Anomaly. This is a really fascinating but like little known place just to let everybody know uh, in the know about. So um, basically it's high up on a ridge um, to, the, to the west of Blickmead. Um, and it, it's a, that ridge would have overlooked the Stonehenge Knoll in a westerly direction. In an easterly direction, it looks back on Blick Meads, and actually south southerly, you can see the Avon. What happens there 
around 3700 BC, so really not much later on than Blit Medes, Mesolithic dates start to fade out, is there's a big feast which involves um, what looks like hunter-gatherer groups with farmer groups. Um, you can, we can divine that by these different types of tools that are in the pits, and also the really unusual split of wild and domestic animals is unique in the UK for having virtually a 50-50 split between the two types. And it's got a big trout in it, which makes it unique for anywhere in the UK, because there was a taboo in the Neolithic about eating fish, so that you don't get fish in any feasting pits. So boil it all down, David. What I think is going on there is you've got some really hunter gatherers. Um, you may well have got a uh, multicultural, dare I say, community going on there. And that big, massive, conspicuous feasting, which goes on for months, sometime in the summer, around 3700 BC, um, is maybe a celebration of people coming together or, or assimilation or maybe appropriation. So I don't think it is the case that we've just got a, we run out of ladder between Blick Meads and the Stonehenge Knoll, it stops at 4,000 and the ditch gets created at 3,000. There's clues there. And you know something else that's really fascinating? Right next to that pit, a henge gets built mm -hmm. around 3000 BC, the Conabry Henge, so it's contemporary with the foundation ditch. Now, obviously, the evidence for the pit would have long gone a thousand years back. But again, it to me suggests that people know where stuff is. There is very embedded stories in this landscape. And it's really good. Bleak Mead is brilliant, but possibly it makes the whole Stonehenge World Heritage site, the discovery of Bleak Mead, more special than we even thought we knew it was, because it bangs a trap door open all the way back to the end of the Ice Age. Mm. It extends its biography. That's, it's amazing. It really is, isn't yeah. it? You know, because we, people think of uh, Stonehenge and its landscape being ancient anyway, prehistoric and um, wonderful, going back thousands of years. But what you're suggesting is it goes back even many more thousands of years yes. than we realised. Um, possibly because there's a multi-cultural um, um, grouping going on there, which, and of course these things all happen by chance and accident. Uh, but, you know, on the other hand, if you know the hunter-gatherer times, People really knew Blick Mead, they really knew that landscape, they're hunting it, they're really resource aware. I'm sure that's getting passed down. Um, and, you know, as Alice Roberts has recently noted, the uh, Bluestone Henge is on top of a Mesolithic campsite. I've, no I've noticed myself in other part, you know, other key, Darrington Walls has also got Mesolithic stuff in it. I reckon the Mesolithic is everywhere between the two of us. And it just hasn't been noticed, just so that everybody knows. Up until Blick Mead, only about 30 flakes from the Mesolithic period found plus the totem pole posts. Now, and we have only dug, because we've been ever so careful, the size of a soccer pitch's penalty area. So it's tiny what we've done. We've been really surgical. We've got um, 90,000 um, pieces of work flint and tools, 3,000 animal bones. You know, so this place is, is blimmin', it's like an artifact cake. <laughs> it's cram packed full. But we just haven't been looking for hunter-gatherers. We've been looking for farmers who build stuff. And so no surprise, you don't see them. And I think that the other thing with um, going back that far in time is it's actually quite difficult to spot. You know, you don't fall mm -hmm. over a mosaic like you do in the Roman period. You, yes. you're, you're not pulling out tons and tons of amphora. You know, there's, there's really not that much to find. You have to really, really use your eyes, don't you? You have to really look for it. Do you think, in a way, Blick Mead is the first stone hand? I wouldn't say that, although we have got, um, bizarrely, we have got a raised stone, which was, we, we, I was very, very uh, cautious about saying that, but we've had Professor Tony Brown make the point, no, that stone's been put in, because you can see there's mud underneath it. And that dates to around 4000 BC. It looks like it's part of a, a, a shelter. So, but I mean, so stone is being used, but I think it's more, I don't, I think in a way it needs to be seen in its own right as special, yeah. not in Stonehenge's uh, shadow. Um, but I think the combination makes the whole thing, it's like the bit in The Wizard of Oz when it turns colour. You know, you just suddenly see it all afresh, how big of a thing is, how 
more broader stories are. Yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? And what I love about um, that whole area is that it really is a whole landscape, isn't it? Mm. Um, yes. And, and so you've got the early stuff, you've got the Stonehenge, the contemporary Neolithic stuff, but then you've got even later stuff as well, uh, you know, just chucking it in there, you know, you've the Roman road, the A303 was a Roman road. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, that's right. And, um, you know, and, and um, there's probably all sorts of finds. We've got, when we had OSL date, so this is optimal stimulated luminescence, just to let everybody know, incredible technology. It sounds like something out of Gulliver's Travels and going to Laputa because you can extract a date from the last time a piece of quartz was exposed to direct sunlight. Can you believe it, folks? And we've had stunning OSL dates from Blickleaf from Tromso University. So yeah, sure enough, lovely fixed dates for this stone platform we found that are lovely late, late Mesolithic, but we've also got Neolithic and we've got a massive Bron middle Bronze Age, where they're doing big field there, um, the, the, and hardly anything from the Iron Age, which is interesting. But then stonking Roman Danny um, uh, agricultural works, all picked up in this amazing time slice. Wow. It goes right the way through to um, to the Ensby Abbey period in the medieval period, all in this one spot. Wow! I, I, well, the terrace team who have come out of Tromso, they say it's the best results from any river terrace from Dublin to Athens. That wow. So we've got such good conditions, you see, there for some things anyway. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> so oh, it's all going on. So I believe you're, you're excavating again? Yes, we're going to be, um, looks like late September to mid-October. And um, this uh, is a really big uh, excavation for us because we know, what, for one of the first times, we know pretty much what's going to be there. We had to curtail um, our last proper excavation in October 2019 because of very bad weather, but we got below the platform surface. And really, so this is nearly our Prince area. And the nearer we got to the original spring shoreline, we just found loads and loads of big animal bones sticking out of the ground like fingers and tons of flea. And it's in situ archaeology, it's amazing stuff. So I, put a big break on it because we need to be doing that really super carefully csi style mm -hmm. so we and, and we know there's going to be a lot coming out so mm -hmm. we're going to be doing that um and uh, we've got uh, as usual um amesby history center being fantastic they're going to be organizing volunteers from amesby it's a key part of our project hopefully there might be a bit of space for others but i, I don't know that it's, it's going to be very tight because you know we are really properly connected up with the town I think that's fantastic, isn't it? How, how um, as a community archaeology project, um, local people have really got behind this. Yes, I do too. And Amesbury, it's been type of um, in the shadow of Stonehenge, but people have been unbelievably committed from the town council through to school kids. People have loved it. And, um, you know, and they love the fact that the History Centre were keen on getting Guinness Book of Records accreditation for being the longest type of occupied place in the UK and of course quite a big amount of those dates came out of Blick Leaves. So um, you know they're rebranding themselves quite rightly. You know they want a bit of Stonehenge's action, uh, the town council. So you know there's cafes going up. It just shows what archaeology can do. You know we don't do a shishi poo poo subject. Actually real commerce comes out of it. People's sense of themselves. You know we've had a number of really seriously injured soldiers on site and um, you know uh, last year when we did some field work we had someone who's really severely brain damaged and the well-being that offered his wife as well as him was enormous you know and uh, and it saves the state money that type of thing as well it gives people brilliant memories yeah absolutely it makes um, amazing connections doesn't it you know people nice. who you wouldn't people are talking to people who they wouldn't normally talk to and yeah oh, it's been so dynamic and we we very much got a type of we we have a small team on site always and that's partly because this is using sort of agile type of you know that community computer type of uh, way of looking at groups you know we've got really small feedback loops so people can be with an expert you can immediately if you're not everybody's encouraged to say I, i've got that wrong or i'm not sure about it and it's so brilliant that honesty the, the, we got way better results because of it. I, I think 
pe people in Amesbury, they're better than an awful lot of undergraduates in knowing what a Mesolithic microlith or a scraper look like. You know, they, they, it's, it's phenomenal the way people have got involved. Brilliant. And I believe that you actually, you won the uh, 2018 Current Archaeology Best Research Project. Yeah, which was just fab and brilliant, brilliant. And this has been such a small scale project. So financially, we've got a much smaller pot than most. So winning the research project of the wall was wonderful mm. type of, you know, endorsement of a lot of good practice and type of careful management, I think, of our own resources. If you had to sum it up in three words, what would be your top three things that you've discovered at this site? Um, I think finding where people were living was very moving. Um, I think um, finding the Aurochs hoof prints was, was, was very moving in another way, incredibly real. It just totally speaks to you. Um, and I think um, the site custodian, Mike Clark, who's been there for 45 years, he was the person that found the slate tall ocean point. I predict that that will be a major artifact in times to come. And uh, I love that it literally is an east meets west moment seeing that tool. Fascinating stuff. Mm. Yeah, it really is. Well, David, we look forward to uh, uh, hearing about how it all goes in September. Yeah, and I hope uh, you've been so brilliant, and I just want to say quickly, I really hope we. You know, we can be working there for time because we've got the Stonehenge Tunnel. And in fact, the hearing is this Wednesday. Um, so uh, this is a judicial review, folks, which is looking at the government's decision to go ahead with um, this uh, whacking great tunnel and, uh, and, and flyover, which will go right behind our site. In fact, it's only about 10 metres away from one of our trenches. And um, we're, of course, very against it and um, played a big part in organising the opposition to it. So we're going to find out if the judges um, ratify the government's decision or whether they uh, go with what the planning inspectorate and nearly all of the archaeologists who've worked in that area for the last 30 years have said, which is it shouldn't happen because it's going to um, destroy the archaeology. And on a site, can I just say, on a site like ours, we've been talking about dog's teeth and oryx hoof prints and other bone as well. And we know we've got, you know, interesting algae there as well. It's so delicate. And um, it's such from a, such a long time ago. You know, it would be a crime to lose these stories. It just silences the hunter-gatherer bit of the past once and for all. And, you know, I, it would be a tragedy, I think. I don't want to be over the top about it, but it would be heartbreaking. Not not just for the individuals now, but just for our children, our children's children, to lose this. But it's great speaking one to one. Thank you so much. You're very welcome, David. Look forward to catching up with you, and uh, thanks very much for uh, chatting with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks, David. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. We can't do any of this work without you, so please subscribe, back us on Patreon, and make sure that Time Team comes back again.